Hi, welcome to our next episode of The Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany. And uh, before we get started, I just wanted to, for our people who are watching on YouTube, we got a new background here. Yeah. Nice little uh, graffiti art that was... Uh, I bought off of uh, Amazon, but it kind of gives a little bit more color here. And then yeah. you're very colorful today. You've got your Halloween costume on. Yep, it's snowing outside and there's a blizzard, but today is Halloween, so we decided to have fun. Yes. You know, Dr. Hosek, he was the, what are you, a tribal doctor? No, this is just my my colorful scrub top here. This is colorful. You know, please, if you're watching this, let us know if he disappeared into our backdrop. <laughs> I told him he would, but he he's still fabulous. And this week we've got a, a new wellness topic. We're going to talk about wellness lab tests. Okay. So a lot of times uh, people will bring their pets into the clinic for just their shots and an exam. And the veterinarian would might say, hey, let's do a wellness blood panel. And then people go, well, well what's that for? Yeah. So we want to explain why would be the reasons we'd want to do a wellness blood panel or wellness lab test. Because there's more than just blood that we're testing. We'll sometimes do a urinalysis. Mm -hmm. And this is in addition to the parasite screenings we'll do, the heartworm test, the stool samples. And there's several components to the wellness lab test that we're going to be looking at. Mm -hmm. And even though an animal may look healthy, maybe not find anything on the exam, there may be things on the blood test that might be indications of early signs of disease, yeah. chronic problems that might be going on that, that bother the animal that you're not aware of, mm -hmm. or exposure to certain things that are affecting them as well. Well, and people don't think, you know, it's just like when you go to the doctor, you get yearly blood testing and things done like that, and you can go in and you could be completely healthy, but the doctor will still say, let's run blood to make sure everything is normal. Yeah. They want to have your normal, so if something does ever happen, we can compare, you know, what our numbers look like compared to how they were two months ago or something like that. Exactly. So it's kind of the same thing. You know, they may look fine, but yeah. you, you can't talk to a kidney and ask how it is. <laughs> well, um, there's two parts to the blood. There's the cells. So we mm -hmm. do what's called a complete blood count. And that's type, looking at the three different types of cells that we have in there. The red blood cells. We're looking for anemia, which is low red blood cells. Mm -hmm. Polycythemia is the opposite. So that's when you get too many red blood cells. And mm -hmm. so there are some diseases that cause that. Yeah. Um, and sometimes the anemia can be due to immune problems. Yeah. Um, there's a type of cell, uh, red cell that will appear called a nucleated red blood cell that's associated with lead poisoning. Oh. So if we see a lot of those, it might be an indication of the animal's exposure to lead. Mm -hmm. um, if we have an anemic animal, we're going to try and find the cause. It can be parasites, uh, it yep. could be bloodborne infections, it could mm -hmm. be a bone marrow issue. So it's a good good thing to tell. And animals don't necessarily get too sluggish until their their pack yeah. cell volume or the red cell count gets very low, yeah, especially yeah. cats. Yeah, yeah. Cats can get quite anemic before they become clinical. Um, the the next part is the white blood cells, and there's uh, a bunch of different types of white blood cells we're looking at, um, but they can be an, an indication of infection or inflammation. Um, if you have a high number of a certain white cell, particularly in lymphocytes, that can be a sign of leukemia. Mm -hmm. And we've diagnosed animals with leukemia it's just on routine blood tests. So yeah. again, we detect it before they start showing symptoms. You can get a low white cell count or a leukopenia if they're exposed to certain toxins, if something that affects their bone marrow. Um, I've seen very low white cell counts in animals that are fighting a bad infection because yeah. all the blood cells are leaving the blood and going into the infection site. Mm -hmm. Um, the types of white blood cells can tell you a lot, too. Um, there's a type of white blood cell called an eosinophil that's often yeah. associated with allergies or parasites. Um, we can see a type of cell called a mast cell that um, usually is associated with mast cell tumors but can be elevated in the blood, too, in later stages of that disease. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we're concerned about certain masses, a, a, a blood count can help us to distinguish that as well. The third part of the blood is the platelets. Mm -hmm. um, platelets are the little pieces. They're actually full cells or cell fragments that are used to help clot blood, yep. to get the blood to stick together. Yeah. If they're low, um, that can indicate that they're being used up or they're being destroyed by the body's immune system. Just mm -hmm. like there's immune problems that cause red cells to get low, you can get the platelets go low. Sometimes we might see an animal get little purple splotches on their skin. That can be a sign of that as well. Yeah. Um, it can also be an indication of a clotting disorder. So if their body has problems clotting or they're clotting too much, it can affect the platelets as well. So that's just one of the things that they're able to tell from this blood blood count. Yeah. Um, the next part is the liquid part of the blood, which we use for the blood chemistry. So we call it a serum sample. And that's where we, we clot out all the blood cells, spin them down, and separate out the serum. And we, mm -hmm. we measure a whole bunch of factors in there. Yeah. Um, the, probably the most common one is the blood sugar. You know, we're going to look to see for early, sign, early signs of diabetes. Um, we can detect diabetes long before the animals are clinical and having really severe things. So mm -hmm. especially if you have overweight cats, we're going to want to do a blood sugar on them. Dogs that are prone to diabetes, like schnauzers, mm -hmm. uh, are another one that would be a good idea to have that done. 
Um, kidney function is very easy to evaluate with the blood panel. We're looking at several factors with that, including the phosphorus, the creatinine, the BUN. Um, usually when those become elevated, it means we've got decreased kidney function, but it can happen if they're very dehydrated. So yeah. if we get sick animals, it's not unusual to see that if they're dehydrated. But if you have a, a well animal that comes in, they're drinking lots of water, and those mm -hmm. are elevated, that can tell you we're starting to get into some kidney decreased kidney yeah. function. Um, liver enzymes can tell us that there's been damage to the liver. Um, there's certain other tests that tell us about liver function. Bilirubin levels are an indication of, bil of liver function. The liver actually um, secretes or manufactures glucose and albumin and uh, blood urea nitrogen. So if those actually start getting low, that can tell you got less functioning yeah, kidney, yeah, yeah. Um, or or less functioning liver cells. Yeah. And we've seen um, animals that have bad teeth, and we do their, their pre-anesthetic blood panel or wellness yeah. panel, their liver enzymes are elevated. Mm -hmm. So that's just a way to demonstrate to the owners that teeth disease does affect their whole body. Yeah. Um, we can also see uh, one of the liver enzymes, alkaline phosphatase, is also associated with some other diseases like Cushing's disease, mm -hmm. which is too much, uh, um, too much cortisone being produced by the uh, adrenal glands. And if that's very elevated, we'll want to follow up with an adrenal function test. That can also be an indication of bone problems. So again, dental disease, arthritis. Um, we'll often see it elevated just in young animals just because they're growing. Yeah. yeah. Then there's the electrolytes, which is the minerals in the blood. So we took uh, a bunch of those, potassium and sodium are the big ones. Calcium is important, mm -hmm. magnesium. Um, the ratio of sodium and potassium in the blood could be an, an indication of Addison's disease if that gets low. Mm -hmm. um, you can see elevated calcium with certain diseases like cancers mm -hmm. can cause that. It can happen with parathyroid disease. Um, we're also looking at the chloride and the phosphorus or other minerals that we're looking at. You can see problems with bone uh, disease can cause right. those to get elevated too. So again, getting a baseline is good, but it can be an early indication of, of problems, especially the Addison's disease can creep up, and that can be one of the early indications on that. And there are certain breeds that are certainly more prone mm -hmm. to that than others. Yeah. And just like in people were checking cholesterol and triglycerides, mm -hmm. um, the thing that causes cholesterol to go up a lot in dogs is low thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. So their thyroid hormone goes down, their cholesterol levels go up. Um, triglycerides can be elevated in diabetic animals. And we also look at pancreatic enzymes. Yeah. Um, pancreatitis is one of those things. There's chronic forms of that. So if they're um, chronically affected, kind of having intermittent vomiting, that can be a sign that maybe we need to look at the pancreas for problems going on. Another test we can do with the serum is the thyroid levels. Yeah. And there's several forms of thyroid hormone that we'll usually test. T4 is the most common one, total T4. We might check the free T4 and the T3 levels as well. It can give us a better indication on animals that are kind of borderline or we think clinically they look really hypothyroid but their thyroid levels are still in the normal range they might be low it just helps uh, confirm that diagnosis for us um, and dogs are going to be low thyroid mm -hmm. cats get high thyroid um, people get both but it seems like in in the animal world they gave the low One thyroid the to dogs and yeah. then the high to cats i've never diagnosed a cat with hypothyroidism i have seen a few dogs that have th thyroid cancer where they've ele elevated yeah. thyroid levels but not that uh, common a thing um, but again, if your pet's maybe gaining weight uh, year to year, mm -hmm. drinking more water than you think you should, their coat doesn't look as shiny, yep. checking those thyroid levels can be a good indication that maybe there is a deficiency we need to get that treated. Mm -hmm. Or even for cats, if they start losing right, weight. It's going to be the opposite, though. Mm -hmm. They'll be, losing They'll be weight. eating a lot, losing a lot of weight. Sometimes they're a little more lethargic. Yeah, drinking mm -hmm. a lot of water can mm -hmm. be one of the symptoms as well. Um, and, you know, older cats, is, older animals, it's really important to do these because yeah. uh, you can detect a lot of problems. So any change in their weight, whether it's increase or decrease, you want to be checking these out. And if you've been doing them on a regular basis, on a yearly basis, you can tr watch those trends and changes. Yeah. So you may have a cat that they had the BUN and creatinine levels are still in normal range, but if you look at the trend, they're gradually creeping yeah. up over time, then that might tell us, okay, we need to put this cat on a kidney diet um, and maybe slow down that the, the decrease in the kidney function. Another good test to do is a urine sample. Yeah. Urinalysis is very helpful for us to help evaluate kidney function. If we have an animal with elevated BUN and creatinine and their urine is very concentrated, it's telling me they're dehydrated. Mm -hmm. If their kidneys aren't working, we're not going to see um, the, the urine specific gravity be very high, it'll be very low because their, their kidneys can't make very concentrated urine. Um, we'll do the chemical analysis on the urine, um, which is kind of like the chemistries on the blood. We're going to look at the um, 
glucose levels, bilirubin, mm. protein levels. Um, it can detect um, in markers for white cells and red cells. Mm -hmm. Increased protein can be an indication of kidney disease or infection, mm. inflammation. Um, glucose is a definitely an indication of diabetes. Yeah. Ketones can tell us if there's a ketoacidosis mm -hmm. associated with that. Yeah, there sometimes we run urine samples and we see those numbers are high. Yeah. And then we're like, hey, let's do some blood just to see what our right. they might sugar come in because like. of a, a bladder infection mm -hmm. and then we say okay well we got high sugar here yeah that makes a great thing for bacteria to go on but why is their sugar high so yeah. yeah they might be diabetic and then we'll um look at the what's called the sediment so if you take a urine sample and we spin it in the centrifuge you get a little bit of solid yeah. material a little pellet that forms and normally you don't see much of a pellet at all in a normal urine it should just be kind of liquid with some mm -hmm. of these things dissolved in it but we're looking for crystals that can be an indication of metabolic problems. Uh, we're looking for the uh, cells there as well, white cells, red okay. cells, the ratio of those can tell us whether it's just a little bit of bleeding from doing a cystocentesis or whether it's an actual inflammation or infection. Mm -hmm. If we can see bacteria, that's helpful. Um, generally, I'm gonna put more weight on bacteria if we get the sample here in the clinic, if someone brings in a urine sample yeah. and it's contaminated, we might see lots of bacteria in there. Mm -hmm. it doesn't it's really not like anything. off the floor, you know. Right. Dirty. There's a, a type of um, formation called casts, which form in kidneys. Um, and if they're shedding out of those, that can be an indication of kidney okay. failure. Um, epithelial cells from the uh, the bladder wall mm -hmm. can sometimes be an indication of cancer. If oh. we see transitional cell uh, epithelial cells in there, that can be an early indication of bladder cancer. So, And then there's actually some parasites that um, have eggs in the urine. My oh. favorite one, Diactophyma renale. We should do a show on that. Oh, the giant that? kidney worm, Diactophyma renale. Oh. They get to be about three feet long, and they live in just one kidney, in the right kidney. And one, how do you get rid of that? They have to surgically remove it. To take the whole kidney? Take the whole kidney. Well, there's not much of the kidney. They eat the kidney out, and they live oh. in the capsule and feed off the blood. There's one <gasps> female, which is about three feet long, and the male is about eight to ten inches long, little little guy. Huh. Yeah, they get it through uh, contaminated fish and stuff. It's very common in oh. uh, uh, the upper north um, so this Minnesota. So is just animals, like or do people get that too? Or? Um, there's been cases in people, but it's primarily the canids, the, oh, the no. dogs, the wolves, foxes, things like that. Ah. Yeah. All right. So those are the tests that um, your vet might suggest uh, to do the wellness panel for them. Um, we've got some deals where we get all those tests for a really kind of a, yeah. a good price. Uh, a lot of times we'll just throw in the heartworm and the uh, uh, tick panel with that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so generally, it's a good idea to ask your vet, hey, should we be doing wellness on, on my blood test, my yeah. pet, want to know what's going on? It's a good way just to kind of evaluate things and see how they're doing. Mm -hmm. But if you are seeing any changes in your pet's condition, it's always a good idea to do it. Um, and like I said, having that baseline is very important. Yeah. So check with your vet. And when you go in for that annual checkup, just like you said, you go to your doctor, they're going to want to do the blood mm -hmm. test on you. We would really like to do that too so we can detect these problems early mm -hmm. and treat them more effectively. And don't think it's just like an age-restricted thing too. We have diagnosed, you know, a lot of things in young puppies and kittens too. We've had a puppy that yeah. was in kidney failure before. Right. It was a four-month-old puppy. And the owner just brought it in because she drank a lot, pee a lot, and looked at her blood, kidney failure. Yeah. You wouldn't think you would see that in a puppy. So don't think just because they're young that, you know, they're excluded from having to do all these testings or things like that. You need to test at any age yeah. because they can have anything. And, you know, one of the things we'll, we'll talk about at another time when we do our spaying and neutering talk next week, we're going to do a pre-anesthetic lab test, mm -hmm. too. And that's, those are generally fall into this wellness lab test family, but mm -hmm. it's also going to help us decide what's safe for anesthesia and things yep. like that. All right, let's move on to pet health news. Okay. All right, so we've got some really neat stories this week. This week. Um, the first one I want to talk about is a new bill that's passed in the House, in the Congress, that now is making yes. animal cruelty a federal felony. Good. So it's, again, they've got the new acronym, P-A-C-T, the Preventing Animal Cruelty and Torture Act, mm -hmm. or PACT Act. And it closes a loophole in previous uh, legislation. Um, apparently there is this problem with crush videos with animals, which sounds really disgusting. Crush videos? Yes, people would crush animals on the, oh, my God. Uh, show this on the Internet. So that's totally illegal, and now it's a felony, and you can go to jail for a very long time for just yeah. having those videos around. Um, the American, Medical, America, American Veterinary Medical Association President John Howe applauded the legislation. It says the passage of the PACT Act is an important step forward for improving animal welfare, criminalizing the cruel and inhumane act of the animal crushing. Yeah. Um, and it's in the Senate now, so hopefully they'll pass that soon, and that'll get signed into law, and 
that's just going to make it a lot harder for people to, to do those things and get away with them. Good. This is kind of a fun story. <laughs> so this and this, these things always seem to happen in other countries, not uh, <laughs> the United States. But this was uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, these uh, owners, uh, Leah and Kent Barrett, um, had a Labrador that was pregnant. They took her to the vet. Okay, and they asked for an ultrasound so they could count how many puppies and know what to expect. The vet said maybe five or six. Hmm. So they know, you know, typically they may finish, she might have eight, so they're mm-hmm. planning on eight. And, uh, you know, the vet told her typically an hour per puppy is typical for labor, so they're planning on an eight-hour labor. Well, the first 40 minutes, she he had seven puppies. Huh. Um, and they knew at that point that things were probably going to get a little <laughs> crazy. <laughs> So um, it was going along pretty well until one of the female dogs kind of got lodged in the birth canal. And she was stuck there for, I think, uh, like 40 minutes. Yeah. And by the time they got her out, she wasn't breathing, wasn't moving. But they were able to revive her. Huh. Uh, they'd been through this before, so they kind of knew how to do a little CPR and rubbing the tummy and stimulating the puppies. And she's actually doing very well now. They said she's the biggest one of the litter. Oh, well, they named her Hope. Right. But uh, Bo ended up having 13 puppies. Um, one short of the record for the breed. <laughs> or, sorry, too short of the record. Actually, 15, 15 of those were born in 2014. So they got some pictures here of all these puppies sitting together. Um, they had to, of course, hand raise some of them because a the mom can't nurse that many at once. If they hadn't, she would have lost some, and that's kind of the survival of the fittest. And, uh, you know, the little one hoped she probably wouldn't have made it at all if they hadn't been there. But, uh, yeah, that's a, a mm. kind of a neat thing. And then they have this little neat fact here at the end of the article. What do you think the largest litter of puppies ever was? You know, we were guessing in the week before. Some people were guessing 16, 20. Yeah. Record is 24, a Neapolitan Mastiff in 2014. That's just crazy. It's crazy. I, I, if the people had that many I, time, did, I was going to say, I can't imagine a human having 24 yeah. children. No. Yeah. Well, but you're only pregnant for nine weeks, so. Uh, that's, no. It's that's, a trade-off. Yeah, 20, yeah again, 24 24 kids, 9 weeks, but for 18 years as a person? No. Ah. <laughs> if you could kick them out after uh, 4 months, maybe it might be a little bit better. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a neat program that I, I read about. It's from PetSmart, um, and it's basically uh, a, it's a program they're funding um, that funds pets' positive impact on learning. Okay. So they have a grant that's going to uh, create 10,000 grants for classrooms. Uh, for the Pet Care Trust Pets, and it provides teachers financial support for the purchase and care of small animals. Hmm. Um, one of the PetSmart people was saying that pets play a valuable role in children's physical, social, emotional, and cognitive development and can also enrich school curriculum. Hmm. And they're proud to help even more teachers incorporate pets into the classroom that can stimulate learning and bonding with the animals. I think that's really important for kids to do yeah. that because not everyone can have pets at home. No. Well, and then I do know that some schools that do this... Um, they rotate. Some of the kids can take the like little pet home for the weekend, mm-hmm. so that like helps with the responsibility. Teaches them how to take care of our pet, and you know, positive about right taking care of animals. And it's been shown that classroom pets help children learn compassion, empathy, and respect for all living yeah. things, as well as reduce stress levels. Yeah. And this was a, a study funded by the Human Animal Bond Research Institute and the Pet Care Trust. Um, one of the teachers uh, basically said, uh, fifth grade teacher Michelle Jacobs, she said her students feel a sense of pride knowing they are completely responsible for the care of their dwarf hamster. Mm-hmm. They see her as an addition to the classroom, and even students who have various emotional, learning, and physical concerns understand she needs love and gentle care from everyone to thrive. Mm-hmm. She's seen many positive interactions and behavior changes because of this wee little classmate. Mm-hmm. So it, it helps the interactions between the students too, which I think is wonderful. We actually take care of a class turtle here. Yeah. Um, Dr. Antonisha, we have a teacher who brings in the class turtle right. to be taken it's, care of and everything. It's important these animals yeah. get, and it can help the students learn about the veterinary care that's important too. Mm-hmm. So they're accepting applications for the 2019-2020 academic year. So um, oh. go ahead and Google that online. Again, that's from PetSmart and it's the Pet Care Trust Pets in the classroom. Okay? All right. Um, this is uh, more of just a, a, an interesting article. It's from Wired Magazine, which okay. I get online. It's nothing to do with veterinary medicine, but they <laughs> came up with this really neat thing about um, uh, an, another ass of use of dogs for um, th- detecting disease. Okay. So they have Freya, who's a Springer Spaniel, and she's been trained to sniff out the scent of malaria. Hmm. So you wouldn't think well, malaria would have a particular scent, but apparently it does. And um, they're trying to look for a non-invasive test for malaria because it's almost impractical to screen hundreds of people or mm-hmm. thousands of, of people, especially if they're not showing symptoms. People don't 
why, yeah. why should they get tested? But if they could you know, go through and, and test them with the smell of a dog, that's a, an easy way to do it. So a team of scientists from the Medical Research Council in Gambia, they visited primary schools with these beige-colored nylon socks, handed them out to the children aged 5 to 14 who wore them overnight. They collected them the next day and shipped them off to England, uh, where this British charity spent the next four months using the materials to train dogs to recognize an odor imperceptible to the human nose. Hmm. So just, they have the interesting fact here about how sensitive the dog's nose is. It can detect substances at one part in the trillion. Whoa. So to put that in perspective, that's a single drop of liquid in 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Wow. Um, so, of course, dogs can sniff out bombs and drugs yeah. and track people, find dead bodies. But they have certainly been using them for uh, detecting cancer, diabetes, tuberculosis, and now malaria hmm. from just the smell. Could you imagine if you had that strong of a sense of smell? Well, right. yeah. And Thank the you. other thing I, I always tell people, one of the reasons, you know, I think dental cleanings are important, we talked about this before, is that that damages their sense of smell. Yeah. And so dogs are experiencing their world through smell. Mm -hmm. And Maud, the dog with no eyes, I mean, her sense of smell is her, <laughs> a, a way that she detects animals that she's hunting which is just crazy when I think about her. <laughs> so in their double-blind lab test, two canines were, were able to p correctly pick out the scent of children infected with malaria parasites 70% of the time, which is actually pretty good. Wow. Um, and uh, they discovered that 30 of the children that they were testing actually were carrying malaria. Mm. So it's just a proof of concept at this point. The work was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they're actually doing a really another interesting thing to eradicate malaria. They're putting out genetically modified mosquitoes that can't carry the malaria. Huh. So they've edited their genes with this CRISPR virus. And then what they do then is they, they replace the, they bump out the normal mosquito population with these. <laughs> so the mosquitoes are still there for the ecosystem, the animals that eat the mosquitoes, but they're not transmitting disease around. Oh, okay. Pretty clever. Um, and malaria kills half a million people a year, mostly yeah. children. So the next stage is, is to see if they can uh, get these dogs to detect these smells under natural conditions with real people. Um, and so if they prove adept enough, the dogs will be useful, uh, be part of a routine invasive, non-invasive screening tool. They can mm. use it at airports and ports. People coming in detect if they are carrying malaria with them. Okay. Especially important in the dry seasons when peop uh, there's not a lot of mosquitoes around, but you can find the people who are the carriers who might yeah. be then uh, acting as a source of infection for other people in the communities. So I think that's just amazing, and I hope that work comes uh, to more here. So, And then... Now it comes time for a new feature. I mean, I mean you're not going to do it every week, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, Dr. Hosek's jokes section. All right. So I've got some Halloween themes ones. And Halloween just passed here, but I just want to kind of get these in here. Okay. So um, which animal run, won the race with the vampire? I don't know. Which one. We don't know. It's still neck and neck. <laughs> okay. What do you do when you cross a ghoul, and an, or what do you get when you cross a ghoul with an owl? I don't know. Something that scares people but doesn't give a hoot. <laughs> All right. This is one of my favorite ones. There's a couple of these. What did the witch get when she crossed a sheepdog with a daisy? I don't know. A cauliflower. <laughs> my God. Why didn't the skeleton chicken cross the road? Why? Didn't have any guts. Oh, my Please. What did the witch get when she crossed the black cat with a lemon? What? A sour puss. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, this was a little bit more intellectual, but I'm gonna. There's gonna people are gonna get this. Okay. Um, scary monster pickup line. Dang girl, are you a werewolf? Cause I'm liking what I see. <laughs> okay, I like that one. Okay. I like that All one. Right. Yes. All right. What do ghost pandas eat? I don't know what. Bamboo. <laughs> Oh, why don't witches go fishing? Why? They can only cast spells. Oh, my God. <laughs> what fairy tale do warty toads like? I go. Goldilocks and the Three Scares. Oh, my God. You're really proud of these, aren't you? <laughs> this, we gotta, this is, this is going to be the most popular segment. All people have stunk through the whole podcast for this. <laughs> Did you hear about the spider love triangle? No. It was a tangled web. Oh, my God. <laughs> Where do you get honey in the graveyard? What? From zombies. <laughs> I feel ashamed because I really had to think about that one for a second. <laughs> All right. 
What do you call a werewolf that doesn't know he's a werewolf? What? An unaware wolf. Oh my god. <laughs> All right, here's another, you have to maybe think about this one. The scary animal grown of the day. This is the last one here. Oh. Sea monster jokes are cracking me up. <laughs> cracking? Get it? I okay. get it. Yes, I get it. <laughs> All right. Please laugh. He was very proud of those. <laughs> let's, let's move on to our case of the week. All right. This is now, we're getting serious now. All right. So um, we're always looking for an interesting case a week to present to our listeners so they can kind of educate them as, as to some of the problems that we see, maybe not regularly, but uh, very interesting. So this week was Frida, mm -hmm. and Frida I saw last Saturday for um, a recurrence of a growth. So a couple months ago, she had actually had some mammary tumors removed and was spayed at the same time. Mm -hmm. So she's an older cat. Yes. And one of the things we're going to talk about this more next week when we talk about spaying and neutering, but um, if you don't have your animal spayed, early, it mm -hmm. greatly increases the risk for breast tumors. Mm -hmm. In cats, 90% of the breast tumors we detect are malignant, oh, about 50% yeah. in dogs. So there, when we did the, the histopathology, um, looked like we got all of the tissue out, but they started to notice this lump okay. in her um, armpit um, a couple months later, and they just noticed it for a few days. And I felt it, and I thought, okay, well, maybe it's another area of mammary tissue where the cancer had spread. Um, so we scheduled her for surgery. They wanted to make sure that we went back and got okay. all of it. Okay. Um, it actually appeared that this mass was underneath the muscle. So it might have been a, a lymph node mm. or something invaded some of the, one mm -hmm. of the vessels yeah. and got in there. And again, visibly, I feel like I got it all out. We'll send it off to the lab and get the biopsies back. And Rita's a really good cat. I mean, yeah. I understand really why they wanted to go ahead and pursue additional surgery and stuff. And um, the surgery went very well. But it's just scary when you have these cancers and they're very mm -hmm. invasive like that. Um, a lot of times we're not doing follow-up chemotherapy with cats. It's just too difficult, yeah. not good results with those, especially if you get a, a biopsy back that says you've got complete excision. And you can have the cancer sitting in the lymph node, mm -hmm. and it just doesn't start growing until maybe the other tumor's gone. Mm -hmm. So hopefully by debulking it, she'll do, do well. But it's just I want to make this cautionary tale. If you're debating whether or not to get your, your dog or cat spayed, mm -hmm. no. get it done. Cancer is a big thing in mm -hmm. dogs. You've got testicular cancer, prostate cancer. So just get these things done. If you feel any lump on your animal, mm -hmm. don't wait. Yeah. Get it no. checked out right away. The sooner we can get these and remove them, mm -hmm. the better chance we have of yeah. getting that cured. The longer treated. you wait, the harder it is for us to remove it, the more of a chance that something could spread if it is malignant. Um, you know, the harder, if it's a big mass, sometimes it's harder to close up, so then you have to keep coming back for bandages or things like that, you know. And just think of what you're putting your pet through at that point where it could have been just two weeks of recovery. Now it's like two months yeah. of, you know, slowing down, sometimes painful recovery. Right. Okay. Um, tech tips. Yeah. All right. So I asked Brittany what she want to do for tech tips this this week. Um, it was snowing outside. It's, it's, uh, it's a like blizzard outside right Halloween now. <laughs> and we got snow coming down. Mm -hmm. So she said, let's do winter uh, pet yep. care tips. So what do we got? What are the things people need to be aware of here now that it's getting colder and snow's on the ground and yep. all this other stuff going on? Well, most people have to think, you know, yes, your dogs and even cats too. Yes, they come with their own insulated coat, but you have to think of their paws and things like that. When it is 20 degrees outside, snow and ice, you don't walk outside barefoot or in flip-flops or things like that. You should think of the same care for your pets. If you're putting on thick socks and boots, you want to put on something for them too. Um, you know, depending on how cold it is, sometimes when that weather drops so much, you can cause a hypothermia. Mm -hmm. We can get frostbite. Right. Um, and, you know, sometimes once we get that damage to the paw, it's hard to bring it back. Um, so you have to think of, you know, putting on little booties, especially if you plan on taking them for walks or if your dog likes to play outside. Mm -hmm. um, one of the pet trainers that I'm talking to, she said if you want to practice with bo um, booties, put them on opposite paws. So, like, if you put it on the front left paw, put it on the back right. So they have a chance to balance it out um, because if you just put them, like, on the, first, the front feet, they're just going to kind of balance and lean forward. Yeah. Or if you do it on all four, they're not okay. going to walk at all. Okay. So you want to give them a fighting chance and do opposite paws. Um, and then, you know, if your dog just That's refuses the booties. Yeah, I thought it was weird at first, yeah. too. But then when she really started talking about it, I'm like, okay, yeah, give them a chance to one paw feels normal, one paw's covered. I would never have thought of that. <laughs> um, but if your dog is just the one who refuses to do booties, 
um, there are things that you could do with like beeswax or things like that that um, actually coat the paw in a yeah. thick layer or a thin layer of wax for protection against the cold and then salt. And salt and the mm -hmm. chemicals, yeah. Most people they're, don't they're realize real. that most salt outside to melt the snow is actually harmful or even ice is actually harmful for most of our pets. Yeah. Um, so that day. can be burn some of the yeah. paws. It can be painful. You don't want them licking it off. Um, so this nice waxy coating just... Helps them walk right across like nothing's ever happened. And then, you know, you can get home. Sometimes you can peel them off pretty easily. Or oh, wow. sometimes they just sit there and they just kind of slowly melt off because now your house is warm. But you don't even really see it in the house. And if it's beeswax, so if they eat it, it's not toxic or anything. But, and then most of them are like such pet safe ingredients. There are a few of them we were reading into them last year that you could just do at home with like four or five simple ingredients. Just put them all in a pot, boil it up, and then put them in some fun cans. And they're simple, they're easy, they last for a long time. You can make okay. them. They have some where you can give them, put them in cute little cans and give them to other people who have pets. You just dip uh, their foot in there? You just take it and rub it across. Rub it across. It's almost okay. like um, for ladies when they have like Carmax or something, you just rub a finger and just rub okay. it across. You can even do that right. for their paws too. Yeah. Um, so that's something, or then even um, just a coat or something, you know, just right. because, especially for the shorter paired breeds. And the little guys too, yeah. the little poodles and stuff, they're going to get really cold mm -hmm. without a coat. Like they have that extra fur and yes, their body temperature is a little higher, yeah. but they still get cold. And again, if you put on a coat, they need a coat too. Right. Um, and you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's fun. You dress up your pet. It, they're cute. They have matching coats. You can match your dog. Let's get a cute matching parka. Right. Let them feel included, but they also feel warmer too. And this is something that it helps to get them used to when they're younger. So right. as they get older, they don't fight you for it, especially as they start getting older. They are going to need a little more protection mm -hmm. um, from the weather. But again, yeah, it just helps keep them warmer, right. keeps them safer. And then just kind of like in the summer, you don't leave a hot pet in, or a pet in a hot car. You don't want to leave your pet in the cold car either. Right. It's going to be really cold in there, especially if you have leather seats. Your seats are going to be cold. Right. You don't want to leave them in a freezing car. We had that polar vortex last year where it was like, you know, minus 20 degrees. Mm -hmm. Your pet's going to basically, they may not even want to go outside. Yeah, no. But you don't want them outside for a long period of time. Mm -mm. Frostbite can settle in very quickly, just yeah. like with people. So more than a few minutes is, is too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we literally just told people outside, poop and pee, and then back in the house. Yeah. If your pet had an accident, we told them don't be mad at them. We told them to have an accident in the house. It was better than losing a paw to go outside. Yeah. And then, well, you get some breeds that really like the cold weather, the huskies yeah. and, and malamutes and stuff. So, but they still need you know special care of their feet, yeah, uh, because th with that long hair in their feet, they can trap that stuff in there even mm -hmm. more. Yeah, so it's easier to, to wipe their paws off yeah. when they come in the house, especially because you don't know if they have salt caught in their paws or, you know, there are still like. What do you call those? The prickles, the burrs, the things like yeah. that. They're still outside. They're just buried under snow. Yes. So you want to make sure those aren't just piling more and more up in their paw. Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, we actually had one, I don't know, like a doodle or something come in because it was limping. And it had like eight burrs in between the paw pad just caught all in the fur. And the owner was like, right. we don't know. They went outside and now he just not And they didn't walking. notice it. They no. Just, but when you went and get to examine it, you found mm -hmm. it. We yeah, shaved them all out and he too. walked away happy as can be. It's got to hurt when you got that little mm -hmm. pointy thing stuck between your toes. Imagine you stick that in your sock. Exactly. Okay. And then, um, you know, same thing if you have an outdoor cat. They're usually pretty smart. They're not going to try and sneak out yeah, when it's really usually. cold. Um, some people like to put out heated things for outdoor animals. Mm -hmm. um, make sure you have uh, a heated blanket for the, the yep. animals to come in and, and get out of the really freezing cold. Mm -hmm. um, if you're putting out water for them, that needs to be heated too because otherwise that freezes up and they freeze. can't get anything. Yeah. Um, some owners, or I've read on some websites, you know, for stray animals, some owners have gotten like the big plastic moving tubs and just cut a little opening in it so the lids close and then they put down a few blankets so you know the strays can have a place to shelter so they're not under cars or you know places where they can get run yeah. over or yeah. hurt or you know trying to get in your garage or something oh well, and that's the other thing it's like uh you know checking your engine before you start it because sometimes mm -hmm. animals like to crawl up they in like those warm engines yes. yeah so baby on the hood scare them out mm -hmm. yeah okay 
Well, those are some really good tips. And if you have questions, ask your vet. Ask your veterinary technicians. Yep. <laughs> they kind of know sometimes more than we do. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about spaying and neutering, why that is so very, very important. Uh, we got Spay Neuter Month coming up in February, mm -hmm. National Spay Neuter Month. But um, it's just you know something when you're getting a pet, uh, you're definitely going to want to consider doing. And we're going to yes. give you the reasons why and what's involved in the procedure for doing it. Yeah. All right. And so that's it for this week. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. And Brittany. We'll see you next week. Thanks.